Chapter 81 What a tenacious young man you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator Nyo I dot bo studio editor Nyo I dot bo studio dot link made the correct decision in an instant. He had just escaped from Morpheus' murderous plan but was in no position to be relieved or to even worry about his injury. He swept his gaze across the hall and hollered, Jacker, Anderson, resumed the attack on the elemental puppet. Everyone had left their original post following his injury, but Link was clear that their greatest threat was still the elemental puppet. Jacques was nothing but a chess piece in Morpheus' elaborate plan. After Link escaped the ambush, Jacques had outlived his usefulness. Morpheus, on the other hand, was a powerful legendary magician. Even if only a part of his power was present in the form of a puppet, he was still extremely dangerous if not dealt with in time. It would only take him a matter of seconds to do something unexpected. The fact that Link was alive and still energetic enough to give commands put Jacker at ease. Although he was fuming with rage and desperately wanted to grind Jacques into minced meat, upon hearing Link's command, he immediately commenced the assault on the puppet. Anderson also charged forward before exclaiming, Link is such a tenacious young man. To think that he can still remain conscious after such a serious injury. Previously, Anderson did not think highly of Link. This was not because of his suspicions of his magic, but due to Link's tender age and frail physique. He felt that any brandish of the sword would scare the wits out of this young man. He thus never understood why Princess Annie held Link in such high regard. Link was a genius magician, but similarly, there were many other genius magicians in the palace. As the princess, there was no reason to give Link this much support. But now, it all became clear to him. He was ashamed of himself. If he were to be met with such circumstances, he would definitely have been defeated. Also, after looking at the way Link responded to the crisis, he was convinced that he would even suffice as an opponent to Link in a battle. Morpheus, on the other hand, was perplexed. How can this be possible? To think that his ambush was foiled. Even though the opponent was physically damaged, he was still fully conscious. And as long as a magician was conscious, his battle prowess would not be affected. No wonder this magician could defeat Andy and Philidia. He wasn't just lucky. This was not the first time Morpheus met a valuable opponent, however, to be defeated by the same bunch of rookies twice in a day, that was a first. Absorbed in his thoughts, he momentarily forgot that he was in the heat of battle. His loss of concentration gave Jacker a chance to charge into the elemental puppet with full force. Boom! The puppet sauntered unsteadily backwards from the impact. Anderson immediately followed up with a heavy sword attack, successfully damaging the neck of the puppet and aggravating the previous injury by another two inches. This swing of his blade also destroyed the rune formation of the elemental puppet. The elemental puppet stopped in its tracks and light began spilling out of the cracks in its exterior. The granite on its body began to fall off, signaling that there was a problem with the rune formation that controlled its movement and maintained its form. After a few violent spasms, the puppet's arms hung lifelessly from its body and the black aura surrounding it completely dissipated. It was now merely an ordinary rock. Morpheus' elemental puppet was now destroyed. But the disintegration of the puppet continued. This might be due to the heated battle which completely destroyed the integrity of the rocks itself, previously held together only by Morpheus' legendary power. All that was left in the end was a black crystal the size of a fist. The black crystal was inconspicuous, other than Link, no one noticed its existence. They were all more concerned with Jacques' betrayal. His sinister voice had also been completely cut off. Lucy took advantage of Jacques' foot injury and unleashed a flurry of nine slashes at Jacques' heart. The Gale sword was light and almost weightless, and on top of Lucy's rage, the insane slashing speed was something Jacques couldn't defend against. It was barely a second before his heart was thoroughly punctured. After completing her mission, Lucy dashed towards Link and held him in her hands, My lord, how are you feeling? She undressed Link without hesitation to reveal the injury underneath. My lord, 
how can it be? Lucy covered her mouth with her hands, tears flowing out of her eyes. It was a three-dot-inch dot-long injury across Link's abdomen. Under the effect of the battle aura, the surrounding flesh was also thoroughly destroyed and blood was gushing out of the wound. To a common soldier, this was definitely a lethal wound. This was also an internal injury and there was no way to stop the bleeding. They could only watch as Link's life slowly slipped away. But my lord is only seventeen this year. Lucy sobbed uncontrollably. Jacker, Anderson and Gildern also fell silent at the sight of the wound. Their experience was telling them that Link could not be saved. On the other hand, Link was amused by their reactions, what's up with all of you? I'm not dead yet. Lucy, this is merely a small wound, stop crying. What? Lucy looked at Link with puffy eyes. This was merely a small wound. She could not understand. Link placed his hand gently on his wound and started concentrating mana. A white light enveloped his hand, this was the precursor to the level point two blizzard spell. Of course, Link was not planning on using Blizzard on himself, he was simply using this spell to accumulate water element particles. By maintaining the spell at this precursor state, water elements surged continuously to the wound and turned into ice. After around 30 seconds, Link removed his hand. He had frozen the entire wound and even the area surrounding it, effectively stopping the bleeding process. As the tissues and nerves were also frozen, he could barely feel any pain. Naturally, this was only a temporary measure, with serious side effects on the body. But that would not be a problem. As soon as he returned to River Cove Town, he could be treated with divine healing spells. Such wounds were nothing compared to the healing prowess of a priest. Link stood up and tried walking for a few steps. His abdomen area still felt slightly uncomfortable, but the feeling of his energy constantly being drained due to heavy bleeding was gone. Feels good, he smiled at the rest of his squad, look, merely a small wound. He also cast an elemental healing spell on himself which would rapidly replenish the blood he had lost. Apart from looking slightly pale, one could tell that Link was fine. I could probably last three days in this state, Link said as he smiled. Although he was out of danger, his abdomen area and the organs around it had completely lost its function. He would not be able to ingest any food, though he could replenish his energy simply by casting elemental healing on himself again and again. This was unimaginable on earth, but in the world of firemen, anything was possible. The squad was at a loss for words. Have you ever seen someone who could still joke and move around after being stabbed in the abdomen? Even though they were already used to Link's strange tactics, this was way too amusing. But they were extremely relieved. Lucy wiped her tears and blushed. She did not expect herself to lose her usual calm demeanor. All right. Let us check if the path is unsealed now that the puppet is defeated, Link laughed. Almost immediately, Link saw a message from the game system. Mission. First step escape. Player rewarded with 30 Omni points. Next mission. Search for the Cliff of Howling Winds, uncompleted, that's 30 more Omni points in the bag. Link was satisfied. Chapter 82. Gaining a Noble Ally You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Nyo I. Bo Studio Editor. Nyo I. Bo Studio Sure enough, the illusion in the passages was gone and the conditions in the cave returned to normal. Finally, it was over. They all heaved a sigh of relief. Should we search for spoils before leaving the cave? Link suggested. The mercenaries agreed immediately. They had almost lost their lives fighting in this cave, even Link was stabbed with a sword. How foolish would they be to leave with their hands empty? Moreover, Link seemed to be in good spirits now and there were no visible signs of fatigue from the serious wound. In fact, he looked much better now. That made the mercenaries less anxious to go back and tend to Link's injuries. Only Anderson hesitated. He was a royal knight of the Norton Kingdom. It didn't seem befitting of an honorable knight to kill men, 
set fire to the corpses, then rob them of their belongings. Are you sure we should be doing that? Maybe we should hurry back to rally the militia, said Anderson. He had to be careful not to tarnish his pride and honor as a member of a noble family and a knight. Link himself was the son of a viscount so he perfectly understood the underlying sentiments that made Anderson reluctant. Even so, he'd much prefer to live and thrive rather than die in the name of idealistic concepts like honor and chivalry. Still, Link knew that integrity was without its merits. He and Anderson had fought together in this mission, so they were comrades now. He had to find a way to persuade Anderson without making him think that his integrity was in question. General Anderson, if we are to call in the militia, then we'd have to divide the share with them as well. Plus, there's no way of keeping a secret when many people are involved, so words will surely spread out and more people will try to grab a slice of the cake. Ultimately there'd be next to nothing left for everyone. Wouldn't it be best to divide everything amongst just the five of us? Said Link. Before Anderson could interject, Link continued, General, before you refuse, why don't you think of your son? You said he's already started his training. I'm sure he wants to become a knight just like you when he comes of age. But a knight will need armor, a horse and his own weapons, and none these things come for free. Why don't you stop and consider how much the loot might benefit your son in the future? When Link put it this way, Anderson was no longer able to argue with him. Link's words had hit upon the things that had been worrying him lately. It was true. What good was there in being an honorable knight if he couldn't secure a good future for his son? At least, with enough gold coins, he could provide his son with some high dot quality magical gear. Ah, what was the point of getting hung up on his own honor? He should be thinking about more practical things like gold coins. Let's do it, then, said Anderson, completely beguiled by Link's sly rhetoric. Soon after, they began to search for everything inside the syndicate's lair. Anderson's movements were still clunky and unsure. He still couldn't completely let go of his ideals as a knight. The mercenary trio, on the other hand, were professionals in this regard. They swept through the cave like a swarm of locusts, much to the wonder of Anderson who stood staring at them on the side. Meanwhile, Link didn't help much as he needed to rest. But when the rest of them were preoccupied with the search for booty, he surreptitiously sneaked away into the dark hall in the underbelly of the cave to pick up the black crystal from under a pile of gravel and put it in his storage pendant. Ednell.co When the others noticed he was gone, they assumed that he was away to examine the elemental puppet, so they didn't give it much thought. Half an hour later, the four of them gathered in the first hall in the syndicate's lair where they found the cursed magic seal. Lucy began to count and record everything one by one. 1,400 gold coins, 38 steel swords, 30 sets of new leather armor, 3 barrels of 50.year. Old aged wine, a pair of gold figurines. The estimated total value should be at least 3,500 gold coins. As expected, the syndicate was much wealthier than the Dark Brotherhood. 3,500 gold coins. Even Anderson couldn't keep himself from gulping in awe at the sheer wealth in front of their eyes. He was a noble knight who lived in a large manor, and had additional income from the land he owned, yet his annual income had been no more than 150 gold coins. Who would have thought that an underworld organization like the Syndicate would possess such unimaginable wealth? The fact simply boggled his mind. What a dastardly group of thieves! It seems I must search and clean out more layers of thieves from now on. The knight was quickly turned into a sly fox by the irresistible temptation of gold coins. And now it was time to distribute the loot, which was decided by Link. Anderson had no objections to this. He had seen and understood how Link was the core of the group, and that they had even managed to defeat an evil demon under Link's command. Anderson had recognized the young magician as a peerless and fearsome man and he was ready to concede to his decisions. There are five of us and about 3,500 gold coins. The four of us will share 2,300 gold coins among ourselves. General, you should get 1,000 gold coins out of the share. 
As for the remaining 200 gold coins, 50 of them should be given to Jacques's family as his pension, and the rest should be divided among the militia. After all, they've made contributions, too. What do you think, General? Anderson was speechless. 1,000 gold coins were far beyond his expectation. He thought of the contributions each of them made. Link was the brain of the mission, and Jacker was the strongest warrior who had played a huge role in defeating the elemental puppet by restraining the puppet and giving Anderson the perfect opportunity to give it the final blow. All he did was one simple move for him, with no risk at all. His esteem and position as a royal knight had not been the slightest bit useful to the mission. How could it be of any use when Link had the support of a much more exalted figure like Princess Annie? He would have been satisfied if the loot was equally distributed, and everyone got about 600 pieces of gold. Isn't my share too big? He had some reservations. He wouldn't mind getting more money, of course, but everyone had risked their lives to get to this point. It would simply be unfair to everyone else and shameless of him to get the lion's share of the loot. They had fought against terrifying opponents together and survived. Deep in Anderson's heart, he had acknowledged Link and the mercenaries as his comrades in arms. Don't say that, General, said Link, waving his hand, you were the one who found the syndicate's lair, and you were the one who gave the element puppets its last blow. What's more, you are a noble knight who shoulders a great responsibility of keeping the peace of the kingdom. Your daily expenses would be much bigger than ours and the money would be put to better use if you take it. If you think of us as friends, then please just accept the money. Link meant everything he said and had no ulterior motives. He valued his friendship with the people who had fought together in battle with him. To him, this relationship was far more precious than a mere few hundred gold coins. Anderson turned silent for a while. He was utterly swayed by Link's speech. Fine, I'll take it, he finally said. Link's sincerity and generosity had left a deep impression on Anderson's heart. He would remember this act of kindness and the extraordinary young man for the rest of his life. Not only does this magician possess powerful magical skills, he also has a good heart and strong integrity. He was even favored by Princess Annie. He will certainly become an important figure in the Norton Kingdom in the future. I must maintain my friendship with him. And that was the most distinct difference between nobles and commoners. Sure, the aristocrats had feelings too. But they never forgot to consider things from a long dot term angle and pay more attention to their interests. As a nobleman, Anderson was much more adept at securing his interests than the mercenaries. After some serious consideration, Anderson decided that becoming Link's ally would be the wisest thing to do right now. Ever thoughtful, Link took out 200 gold coins from the big pile then put them in a bag and handed it to Anderson. General, give this to the militiamen. When we go out later, they will be watching our every move, so we'll divide our share once we're safe from prying eyes in River Cove town. The 200 gold coins were to keep the militiamen quiet. Although Link was certain that the militiamen knew that there would be much more than 200 gold coins in the syndicate's lair, if they did not see anything concrete all they could do was suspect. At worst, they would spread some rumors to the public, but that wasn't too much to handle. The worst thing would be for them to see the entire loot and to know that they only got a small fraction of it. This would surely trigger discontent and resentment, and then more trouble would come from that. Anderson understood how terrible people could become because of gold coins, so he agreed to the plan. Then, Link pointed his wand at the big pile of loot. Suddenly, magic aura shrouded the treasure. Link walked over to the pile and put the items one by one into the storage pendant under the bright cover of magic aura. In doing so, although Link couldn't conceal the existence of his storage pendant, still, at least he could conceal the storage gear. By then Anderson had been accustomed to the sight of Link's magic. Anyway, he was now on Link's side, so the more powerful his ally got and the more tricks he kept hidden from everyone, the better it would be for him. After some cleaning up, they all finally walked out of the syndicate's lair. Once outside, Anderson went straight to the militiamen and addressed them. The lair has been cleared, 
but unfortunately Jacques had perished. I am grieved, but fear not my brothers, I will take care of his family. We found a few gold coins in the cave, and I'll give some of it to Jacques's family as a pension. As for the rest I'll give it to all of you, he said. After he was done speaking, Anderson summoned the vice dot captain and handed him the bag of coins. Matt, take this money, and divide it among yourselves, he ordered. The vice dot captain opened the bag and was almost blinded by the glinting gold inside. His hand trembled at the sight. He was only an ordinary soldier whose annual salary was about 15 gold coins. He'd never seen such a dizzying number of gold coins before, and it almost made his knees buckle. Eventually, each soldier got about one gold coin each. Despite the news of Jacques's death, there was a festive mood in the air. Some of them were suspicious, and some rumors did spread out, but ultimately nothing came of it. So in the end, Link and the rest successfully smuggled the fortune out of the cove without any incident. Once they reached the river cove town, Link invited a priest to heal his own injuries. The divine healing spell was indeed potent. Link could even see his wound healing with the naked eye during treatment. The whole process only took a few minutes time, and it didn't leave any scars on his body. Still, he dared not envy this power. He knew that many magicians in history had been trying to study and emulate divine healing spells, but they'd all stumbled into dead ends. Link conceded that healing wounds fell under the god's domain and that it was beyond a magician's power. Then Link took out the loot from his storage pendant and handed it to the mercenaries so they could manage it. Then he instructed Gildern to discreetly send 1,000 gold coins Anderson. Anderson took the hint. He gave the mercenaries a guarantee that he would station himself in the river cove town to cleanse the Gervant forest of brigands and bandits, and that if the need ever arose, he was always there to help. Thus, the Flamingo band of mercenaries had gained a noble ally. It was late in the night when everything was settled. Alone in his room, Link sat up in his bed and examined the black crystal that had been on the elemental puppet. Chapter 83 the Universal Crystal You Are Listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Nyo Ida.bo Studio Editor. Nyo Ida.bo Studio The Black Crystal was the size of a fist, one would think that it was the shape of a sphere from afar. However, closer inspection revealed that it's in fact a multi dot sided object, similar to a soccer ball. It was translucent just like amber. Link peered through the crystal and observed the flickering candle flames. It looked like a crystal that you could just buy off the shelves of a shop. The only thing out of the ordinary was the slight dark energy emanating from the crystal every now and then. This energy was very vague, if not for Link's sensitivity to magic and his close proximity to the crystal, he would not have been able to detect it. After a moment, an in-dot-game message appeared. Mid-level Domingo Crystal Universal crystal, quality. Flawless level 0.5 effect. Used to store all sorts of energy, elemental, divine, mana etc. Current state. Dark energy, 25% filled. Upon reading the message, Link could not control his excitement. The Domingo crystal was a special crystal body created by the genius alchemist Domingo more than 1000 years ago. It had great versatility in its uses and the creation process was extremely complex. It was thus highly valued and could be sold for a high price. Link estimated that this Domingo crystal in his hand could be sold for 8,000 gold coins, despite only being at level 0.5. I would be rich. The Domingo crystal was very useful to a magician. Take Link as an example, the fastest speed in which he could cast the glass orb spell was 0.04 seconds. In this time, Link only spent 0.01 second constructing the spell structure while the remaining 0.03 seconds was used to accumulate elemental energy. The same could be said for the whistle. In the 0.2 seconds needed to cast the spell, at least 0.15 seconds would be used to accumulate elemental energy. However, with this Domingo crystal, Link could store elemental energy within it. If he stored fire elemental energy, 
he would not be required to accumulate energy before releasing the spell. He would shorten the time needed to cast the glass orb from 0.04 seconds to just slightly more than 0.01 seconds, and the whistle to just 0.05 seconds. He might even be able to cast level 0.3 and level 0.4 spells within one second. That was not all. If mana was stored instead, Link's maximum mana could exponentially increase and solve his mana shortage problem altogether. The Domingo Crystal was indeed a dream come true for many magicians. However, this crystal could not be fully utilized now as it still contained the dark energy that Morpheus stored. He had to find a way to purify it. Find a priest. That was Link's initial thought. When he was playing the game, he had occasionally found some of these Domingo crystals laced with dark energy as loot. His standard practice was to purchase dispelling services from a priest. However, that was in dot game. In reality, bringing such a rare treasure to the priest would create waves in River Cove Town. What if they became targets of assault because of this crystal? This was the difference between games and reality. Games were blessed with an unending amount of resources and developers would fiercely protect the player's rights. Items were simply pixels and codes that could be rewritten and added. But in the world of firemen, resources were scarce, especially spellcasting materials. They could be sold for a high price everywhere. Link hence rejected this idea immediately. Then I guess we can only use that method, although it would take a long time, there is no risk involved. In the game, some magicians did not feel that it was worth spending their gold coins on dispelling services, nor did they have alchemy labs they could use to purify the crystal. They then thought of a method called the torrent purifying method. The magician would place the Domingo crystal into a running stream or any type of flowing water, and under the influence of water elementals, the dark energy in the Domingo crystal would slowly be released. The Domingo crystal in Link's hand was at level 0.5, meaning that it contained at least a level 0.5 dark magic. This level of contamination required one month of purification. Seeing that it was only 25% filled, around 10 days would be sufficient. However, there was a problem with this method. Releasing dark energy into the river was no different from polluting the river with deadly poison. Level 0.5 dark energy was extremely dangerous. In terms of the fire element, a level 0.5 fire elemental spell had the destructive force of fuel.air explosives. If dark energy was indeed released into the river, all life in the river would be contaminated. Anyone who drank from the river would also fall ill. In essence, it was an immoral act. When Link was playing the game, he had once accepted a mission, punished the shameless magician. This magician in question did exactly the thing Link was thinking of, polluting the river and destroying the livelihood of a village downstream. It was an act that was frowned upon. Link could not bring himself to do such a thing. He had to make amendments to the method. As it was getting late and Link needed ample rest to recover from his injury, he kept the Domingo crystal and cast an elemental healing spell on himself before turning in for the night. It was a silent and peaceful night. The next morning, Link was almost fully recovered due to the constant elemental healing and ample rest he got. He felt energetic and even a little too well fed. After breakfast, Jacker, Lucy and Gildern continued sorting out their spoils while Link stayed in the attic above his room. The attic was made entirely of stone, with the exception of the roof, which was made of glass. When the sun shined through the attic, it would be brilliantly illuminated. Link started casting some spells. He used enchanting magic, a shaping spell that created a large water vat connected to the ground. The opening of the water vat directly faced the glass roof, in fact, it would be more accurate to say that it was connected to the glass roof as well. It was impossible to see the insides of the water vat when you were in the building. Link then filled the vat with clear water. The vat was huge and cylindrical in shape. It was almost 4.5 feet tall and 6 feet wide. It took nearly 5 tons of water before it was fully filled. If not for his enchanting magic which strengthened the sturdiness of the attic structure, it might have already collapsed. 
Link then placed the Domingo crystal into the vat. He was now prepared to execute the final step. He climbed to the roof and cast the shaping spell on the attic's glass roofs, melding the glass into its surroundings. This way, it was impossible to open the roof through normal means, preventing anyone from stealing his crystal. He then started changing the internal structure of the glass itself, even going so far as to rearrange the particles to create a complex and intricate refraction structure. No matter which angle the sunlight hit the glass roof, it would be focused by this refraction structure to shine directly onto the Domingo crystal. Sunlight was the world's mightiest source of light energy, with the power to curb all forms of darkness. By focusing the sun rays onto the Domingo crystal, the dark energy within would slowly be purified. Not only would this ensure the consistent and safe purification of the crystal, it would also not be detected by the outside world. Following which, Link created another window and refocused its sun rays to the vat as well. This was to ensure the stability of the purification process even on days where the sunlight was not strong. The Domingo crystal would first release dark energy into the clear water and would only start spilling out of the vat when the water reached its threshold. Link was thus not worried about nightfall as the Domingo crystal would not be able to release that much dark energy in a night. The Gervant Forest was blessed with good weather today, with strong sunlight and a cool breeze. Standing in the attic, Link calculated the time needed to purify the Domingo Crystal. It would probably take around a month for my Domingo Crystal to be fully purified, Link smiled at the thought. Even though it was going to take a long time, it was carried out in a secretive and safe environment. When he left the attic, he transformed the door into a concrete wall. Jacker and the others would probably not go to the attic. Completely sealing the attic off would reduce the chance of the crystal getting discovered. It was not that Link didn't have faith in his comrades, but he generally felt that the less they knew about magic, the better it would be for them. It was noon by the time Link was done. Jacker and the others had returned from their morning sail. Their loot fetched a grand total of 2,500 gold coins in the River Cove Town Black Market. It was an extremely good deal, everyone was all smiles during lunch. Link was happy that everyone was in a good mood. After the meal, Link took out the letter he found in the syndicate's hideout. This was the letter taken from the black dot robed magician who ambushed us when we were at the Red Leaves Cove. Apparently, it was a message for his friend. It mentioned that the black dot robed magician was a dark elf who went by the name Felidia and his friend lived in a place known as the Cliff of Howling Winds. Anyone recognize this place? Everyone searched their memories before shaking their heads. Jacker broke the silence, there are some new faces in town recently. I heard that some are soldiers from the North Habitat and traveling poets from the South, maybe they have heard of this place. I'll go ask around later. That's good, Link nodded, before continuing. From tomorrow onwards, I will be going to the East Cove Higher Magic Academy to study magic, and we probably will not see much of each other. If there is anything important, ask Lucy to write to me. Also, Jacker and Gildern, both of you have to start learning how to read. The only one who can read and write here is Lucy, and that is why she is the housekeeper of the mercenary band. Okay, Jacker and Gildern begrudgingly agreed. As for the gold coins, I only need my tuition fees and 100 gold coins as my living expenses. I will leave the remaining 4,000 gold coins here. My lord. Lucy wanted to object. Let me finish, Link stopped Lucy from completing her sentence, I don't really need a lot of money at the academy. Currently, we have quite a bit of fame in River Cove Town, and Jacker is already a level point four warrior. I guess it is time for us to recruit more members to strengthen our mercenary band. Make use of our connection with General Anderson too. The three of them fell silent. Forming a mercenary band had always been their dream, and now the conditions were ripe. Chapter 84 A new apprentice in the East Cove Magic Academy you are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.W.O. Studio Jacker went out in the afternoon to sniff around the cliff of howling winds. 
He wasn't out for long, though, and was back an hour later. My lord, no one has ever heard of this place, but a bard told me there's a place that fits the description of the name. The place is more than a hundred miles north of the Gervant Forest, informed Jacker. Vague clues were the only thing he managed to obtain. In that case, said Link after some consideration, we should hire someone to investigate this place. If there's any news, contact me. Yes, my lord, answered Jacker. Link had been packing and Lucy was helping him by his side. She was usually a very capable woman but she took her time with the chore this time. She was anxious about Link so much that she would follow Link to the East Cove Magic Academy if she could. Link was at once moved and annoyed by her. Finally in a state of confusion and weariness, he stuffed everything into his storage pendant. Towels, blankets, clothes, and even some of his favorite snacks that Lucy had prepared for him. There was almost no space left in his storage pendant when he was done. The next morning, Link got into a hired carriage and went to the East Cove Magic Academy alone. He was silent all the way there. More than an hour later, he reached the front gates of the East Cove Magic Academy. The same gatekeeper Vincent was there, still basking in sun in the garden. He spoke to Link the moment he saw him got down from the carriage. Boy, I thought I'd never see you again in my life. Who would have thought that you would manage to get into the academy, he said, laughing. Link might have gained some fame and prestige in the River Cove town, but the East Cove Magic Academy was an ivory tower filled with powerful magicians who were the cream of the crop even among magicians in the kingdom. Unsurprisingly, they took no notice of the lives of common folks, so Link's fame had not reached the gates of the East Cove Magic Academy. Moreover, the effects of Herrera's camouflage feathers concealed most of Link's true potential, so in the eyes of Vincent, Link was still the poor teenaged boy whose innate talents in magic were pitiably low. Link, of course, took none of Vincent's derision to heart. He took a magician's bow before Vincent, then smiled and said, Yes, I can't believe my own luck myself. I'm going inside now, Mr. Vincent. Go ahead. Don't waste your good fortune. Vincent nodded at the young man as he went into the academy. Although his talents were poor, he was very humble, so Vincent decided to treat him as another ordinary magician's apprentice. He'd seen almost a thousand students like that every year. Link walked past the academy gates where he encountered a small flat path. He walked along the path for a few hundred feet when then turned a corner. He was unprepared for the view that emerged once he took the turn. In front him, a vast valley stretched across the horizon. Golden rays of sunshine shone down from the heavens like waterfalls made of light, a spacious, flat ground in the middle of the valley. On the flat ground, there were mage towers with blue roofs so tall they seemed to touch the sky. At the top of the towers, there were countless brilliantly shining magic runes flowing around the towers. Threads of elements flowed in the air, crisscrossing each other and making it look like the towers were connected by a magical spider's web. Flowers and trees dotted the space between the towers while a creek meandered around the academy, its surface glinting in the sun. What a glorious view of the capital of magic where the best magicians gathered. It's a beautiful place now, but it may not be long before all that is left is rubble. Link felt both awe for the splendor that stood before him and grief for what would be lost. Although he now had the occultic runes with him, thus undermining the first steps of the Dark Elves' plan, but as long as some of them were still alive, they would never give in until they'd thought of a way to release the demon Tarvis. What would their next step be? Link could only make wild guesses for now. What he must focus on at present was to constantly improve himself before the disaster, so he would not stand helplessly aside when the time came. There was a huge square near the cove entrance where people rushed about to and fro. They were all magicians and they all looked hurried, as though in a race against time. An impressive statue of a magician stood proudly in the middle of the square. Link went over and looked at the nameplate at the bottom of the statue, which read, the founder and the first dean of the East Cove Magic Academy, the level point eight master magician, Ambron. Beneath it, there was a quote from the dean. 
two things are essential in the quest to advance your magic skills. First, to strive for the truth and second, to strive for the power to defend the truth. That's a wise old man. Link could not help but nod in agreement with the statement. Once he'd crossed the square, Link took out the map with directions that Herrera had given him. From the square, take the widest path, go all the way to the third tower on the left, where there's a statue of a hound at the door. Ah, there it is. Bale was a level 0.6 magician and he was a respected figure in the academy. He was one of the core academic council members and his mage tower was significantly taller than the rest. Even the decoration and furnishing inside was much more refined and luxurious than the others. He walked up to the door then summoned a magic mirror, a little trick he learned when he was bored. He checked himself in the mirror and made sure everything was in order, then gently knocked on the door. After a while, a young magician answered the door. He looked to be about 30 years old. Moments later, a notification about him appeared on the interface. Derek level 0.2 average magician status. The magician Bale's apprentice and assistant. The message was brief and didn't say anything about the spells that Derek had mastered, but it was already enough information for Link. Derek stared at the unremarkable youth standing at the door and sensed that the mana on his body was pitifully low. Derek couldn't help but frown at the sight. That morning, his tutor Bale had told him that a new student would be coming today and instructed him to welcome him on his behalf. Derek had thought it was just another trivial chore. But the minute he saw this lanky young man when he opened the door, Derek was swept over by a sense of disdain. So here comes another imbecile who got in through the back door. Derek was not good at hiding his emotions but he realized that although this young man was completely worthless and inept, he was still invited to the mage tower by the magician Bale himself. Derek was sure this young man must have strategic connections in high places, so it's best not to offend him too much. So your link, asked Derek in a frosty tone and with a frown on his face. Yes, that's me. Link noticed the contempt in Derek's eyes, but he thought nothing of it. He was here to learn magic while keeping an eye on Bale. Everything else was trivial and unworthy of his attention. Did you bring your recommendation letter? asked Derek, of course. Link handed over the letter that Herrera gave him. It was written by Princess Annie on behalf of the royal family of Abel, no doubt carrying immense weight and stature within it. Derek took the envelope and saw the Roaring Lion seal printed on it, which got him even more irritated. What a lucky kid. He doesn't seem to have any talent and yet he managed to ride on the coattails of the royal family. Come in. Derek's tone had gotten even colder now. Link followed Derek into the hall on the first floor. It was a spacious hall with an abundance of light streaming in from the outside. There were many tables and chairs teeming with young people. There was, all dot in dot all, about thirty people in the hall. Some of them had their noses stuck in books, some were in quiet contemplation, and others were experimenting with magic. At the corner of the hall there was a large, semi-dot-circular bookcase filled with at least three hundred books. On the other side of the hall, there was a small wine bar with a bartender tending to it. A few young people were drinking there while softly chatting. The scene called to mind the ambience of a tavern. Yet when Link overheard parts of their conversations, he found out that they were discussing magic. What a rich learning atmosphere, thought Link. He carefully sensed the mana of everyone around him and found that most of them were at least mid-level magician's apprentices. In fact, some of them were just a step away from becoming a full dot-fledged magicians. The level here is much higher than Fleming's Academy. Derek led Link to a table at the far corner of the hall. He then explained, this is your table. You're now a beginner apprentice. You're allowed to listen when a tutor is giving a lecture, but you're not allowed to ask any questions, let alone disrupt the class. Understood. In other words, Link only had the right to participate but no right to speak because his magic talents were too low. The questions he asked would only waste the other students' time. Link was happy with what he got, though. It was good enough for him just to be able to get into the academy. 
I understand, replied Link. Good. Follow me, I'll take you to your room. Derek walked towards the corner of the hall while Link hurried to keep up. Eventually, the two stopped at a narrow door below the spiral staircase in the hall. This is your room, said Derek. It was originally a small storage room that was deemed unfit to turn into an apprentice's room. But because the tutor had suddenly received a new member into the mage tower when all the rooms were occupied, they had to make do. Derek could sense from the tutor's tone and attitude that he did not care much about this new apprentice but had no choice but to make the necessary arrangements because it was an order from the dean. So Derek took the initiative and arranged Link to stay in the small room. Derek opened the door, revealing a space of less than 50 square feet. There was a small bed with a nightstand instead of a table, and a small window in the corner. Despite the size, the room was spotlessly clean. There was only magic on Link's mind, he was not concerned about the external living conditions at all. Otherwise, he would not have been able to stay in the river cove in attic for a month. And so all he did was nod his head and brought his luggage into the room. Link didn't seem to have much baggage, all he had were some books and few changes of clothes. He placed everything onto the nightstand by the bed. Derek was still standing in the doorway and saw that Link was done setting his things down. One last thing. You need to do some routine work as a magician's apprentice. What spells do you know? asked Derek. I know Earth Spike, answered Link. Herrera had reminded him earlier that he should maintain his identity as a beginner magician's apprentice. Earth Spike. Good. Derek turned to an apprentice in the hall and shouted, Warwick, get me some blank scrolls. Soon afterwards, an apprentice called Warwick appeared with a handful of scrolls. He glanced sympathetically at Link who was in the room as he handed the scrolls to Derek. What an unlucky guy. Not only did he get the worst room in the mage tower, he's also in charge of such a menial and tedious chore as creating magic scrolls. Derek sent Warwick away, and used the magician's hand to place the stack of scrolls on the nightstand. I've heard that you've been studying at another magic academy before, so you must have the basic skills in preparing magic scrolls, haven't you? Yes, answered Link. Preparing magic scrolls was the most basic skill in the field of enchantment. As for Link's skill level in enchantment, he was sure that he could rival even the level 0.6 magician Bale, so he had no problem at all in preparing magic scrolls. In fact, before going into the syndicate's lair, he had even prepared 20 magic scrolls himself. But of course he couldn't display his true powers in Bale's mage tower. Link had even hidden his matchstick wand away and would now only use a simple ordinary white wooden wand that he made himself. Good, said Derek, now take these scrolls and make sure you prepare at least three earth spike magic scrolls a day. You'll only be allowed two extra blank scrolls if you run out because you've produced defects. If you need more than that, you'll have to pay for it and one blank scroll costs three silver coins. But if you manage to produce perfectly functioning magic scrolls, you'll be paid a silver coin for each. You can get more silver ink and quill pens from Warwick, the magician you just met just now. Any questions? This is ridiculous, thought Link. A level 0, .0 magic scroll would sell for at least 6 silver coins, and the cost of producing it should not exceed 2 silver coins. Not only am I being cheated by getting paid only 1 silver coin per scroll, I'd even have to pay 3 silver coins for each damaged scroll, when in fact these ordinary blank scrolls shouldn't cost any more than 50 coppers. No wonder every famous magician in the game were all wealthy. Turns out they'd all been exploiting the apprentices' hard labor. It was true that this was unfair to magicians' apprentices. Since the magicians were shameless enough to take advantage of the powerless and the apprentices were themselves willing and even glad to be taken advantage of, nothing was ever done about it. Link thought this was probably one of the important sources of income for a mage tower. In the future, he would certainly have his own tower and his own apprentices as well, so this was a lesson for him about how he would manage it in the future. I understand, answered Link. Good, get to work then. Derek walked out of the room and closed the door behind him. 
Finally, Link was alone in the quiet room. He sat on the bed and took a long breath. Then, a notification flashed on the interface. Mission. Enrollment completed. Player rewarded with 5 Omni points. This was a mission that he had received when he first arrived at Gervant Forest, which seemed to happen so long ago. It had taken him quite a while to complete this mission. Mission. Upgrade. Mission details. Master a level point one spell and become a full dot fledged magician. Mission rewards. 15 Omni points. Link had long mastered a level point one spell. He'd even modified it with supreme magical skills and created his own spell, Whistle, so as soon as the notification appeared he had already completed it. As a result, Link was rewarded with 20 Omni points. Coupled with the 30 Omni points he got from the mission of escaping the Syndicate's lair, he currently had a total of 50 Omni points. Another month and a half and the ailing mana effects will be over. I must save these points so I can purchase a high dot level spell when my mana is fully restored. Then, another notification appeared. Mission. Upgrade. Mission details. Master a level point 2 spell and become a level point 2 magician. Mission rewards. 25 Omni points. This mission had also been completed, because Link had mastered a level point 2 defensive spell, Guarding Barrier. So Link's Omni points were now at 75 points. Then, another notification popped up. Link glanced over and found that it was another upgrade mission. Mission. Upgrade. Mission details. Master a level point 3 spell and become a level point 3 magician. Mission rewards. 40 Omni points. Good, this is a mission I can concentrate on for now, Link thought. So Link now had three active missions that he must complete. The first was to upgrade his level, the second was to investigate the magician bale, and the third was to locate the cliff of howling winds. My hands are full with all these missions. Link sighed, then pulled out a blank scroll and started to prepare an earth spike. Chapter 85 The Mage Tower's Economic Operation You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Chapter 85 The Mage Tower's Economic Operation Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio In the blink of an eye, two weeks had passed. Link was sitting in the corner of the hall listening intently to a lecture by a level point four magician on the technique of magic control. Much of this knowledge could not be found in the books that he read and thus were extremely valuable. Link was inspired. He did not want to miss a single detail. This magician went by the name of Darius. He was Bale's chief disciple and was a very high level. As Bale was usually busy, most of the time classes would be lectured by him instead. As a level point four magician, he was the strongest magician an apprentice could hope to meet at the level point one hall. Link listened while comparing to his own spellcasting experience, and found things that he could improve on. After the lesson, many of the apprentices rushed forward to bring up the burning questions they had. Link listened to some of them and could not help himself from chuckling. These were some very basic and simple theories, to think that the apprentices in this academy could not figure them out. He shook his head and headed back to his room to write some magic scrolls. On the podium, Darius was extremely patient and answered every one of the apprentices' questions with a gentle smile on his face. At the corner of his eye, he noticed a calm and almost nonchalant Link sitting at the side of the hall. He did not seem to have the passion that the other apprentices had for magic. Dot what a strange person. As Bale's chief disciple, Darius knew of Link's existence, although he did not get much information either. He simply knew that his teacher received a letter from an old friend and subsequently agreed to take this talentless and taciturn young man under the watch of his mage tower. Magic requires a conversation to generate sparks. What good does it do if he just leaves after listening every lesson? Darius was perplexed. However, he was tied up right now and decided that he would find a time to talk to this young man later. 
Link, on the other hand, was unaware that he had been noticed by Darius. After going back to his room, he sat on the little stool in front of his bed and took out the low dot level scrolls, silver ink, and rune brush, laying them in front of him. He took a look at the blank scroll and adjusted his concentration to be fully on the task before starting to write the Earth Spike spell. During the process, a complete image of the Earth Spike spell formed in Link's mind. He penned every stroke with an extremely clear mind. When Link was completely focused, the rune images in his mind seemed to slowly materialize in front of his eyes. Under his control, this image would then project itself onto the blank scroll. Following which, Link only had to trace the rune images he saw and complete the scroll easily. In about five minutes, Link placed the last stroke on the blank scroll. The whole process was smooth and natural, with confident strokes and no pauses in between. The mana surging through the strokes was tranquil and the completed product was enveloped in a warm trickling light of mana. As usual, it was a success. Now, as long as the user didn't erase the activating rune from the scroll, the Earth Spike spell stored within would be activated. This was true even for ordinary people without any abilities. This convenience was what created a market for magic scrolls. It was the easiest way for a magician to earn his keep. Link was tasked with completing three magic scrolls every day. From his observations these past two weeks, an ordinary apprentice would take around one to two hours to complete a level. Zero magic scroll. If he was unlucky and failed in one or two scrolls, the whole process of writing three magic scrolls could take seven to eight hours. Hence, for an ordinary apprentice, three magic scrolls per day was an extremely tiring task, Link did not even break a sweat. Link continued with the production process and wrote nine magic scrolls within an hour. Only then did he start feeling lethargic. He only had to give three magic scrolls out of the nine, meaning that he could keep the remaining six for himself. Link was taking advantage of the two free empty scrolls per success given by Derek. This was a great chance for Link to stock up some magic scrolls for sale. Link then started reading a book. Naturally, this was not just any other basic magic book, but one he borrowed from Herrera called The Magician's Armor. It offered an in-depth discussion of defensive magic. After Jacques Ambush, Link had been focusing his research on defensive magic so as to create armor for self.protection. However, he was unable to conduct experiments as he did not want to attract Bale's unwanted attention. After an hour of reading, Link was struck by an idea. He immediately took out his thesis and expanded on his current idea. Link was well aware of the difficulty of his thesis, which discussed the nature of space itself. He did not expect to complete this thesis by himself, but he did not feel like giving up either. As he delved deeper into this topic, the progress of his thesis became exponentially slower, but there would come a day where he would finally reach his goal. Two hours passed since Link immersed himself into writing his thesis. Link grabbed his books and magic scrolls and headed out to hand his magic scrolls to Warwick. Link now had a rough idea of how interpersonal relationships worked in the Mage Tower. Every apprentice in the tower would take up an extra role other than studying magic. Some would help in brewing basic potions, some with enchanting and others with the writing of magic scrolls. Warwick was in charge of the magic scroll branch and Derek was, overall, in charge of low-dot-level magic items. The magic items created would then be sold. Naturally, most of the income would go to Bale, but a substantial amount would also be given to the apprentices. This was one way apprentices could earn a stable income while studying in the Mage Tower. When Link appeared, Warwick greeted him with a smile, done in less than five hours. That's pretty fast, Link. Warwick received the scrolls with glee and made a special marking on the scrolls that Link made. As one of the strongest apprentices, Warwick was currently learning level.1 Fire Elemental Magic. If he succeeded, he would be considered an official magician. He was considered a genius based on his current achievements and had an eye for good quality magic items. The scrolls submitted to him were all successful, but he realized that even within these scrolls, they would be marked with a difference in quality. 
Link's magic scrolls would almost always end up in the batch of highest quality scrolls. The scrolls he wrote were of extremely good quality, with stable output and 20% stronger magic power. And to their largest group of customers, the mercenaries, a strong and stable magic scroll was well worth the few extra silver coins they had to pay. After all, this scroll could save their lives in times of need. Link's scroll could be sold for eight silver coins, while Warwick only had to give six silver coins to Derek for every magic scroll sold. The remaining two silver coins were naturally pocketed by him. Most low dot level magicians were in need of money. As Link could bring him extra income, Warwick was especially nice to him and overlooked certain strange occurrences, such as the fact that Link always needed to consume three blank scrolls before he could create a successful one, despite the quality of his scrolls. Link also knew of the situation on the ground. However, this was a mutually beneficial situation where both Warwick and himself would earn extra income. It was a pleasant cooperation. Who would complain of having too much money anyway? This scroll took me around one hour, how can that be considered fast, Link laughed and started walking off. He needed to discuss his reflections for the day with Eliard. Darius was wrong about Link. It was not true that Link didn't like to converse with others, but that he was unwilling to converse with the apprentices in the Mage Tower. Only by talking to exceptional geniuses like Eliard would he truly benefit. Hey, wait a minute, Warwick stopped him. Is there a problem? Link asked. Warwick looked around before whispering, do you want to earn even more? Of course, Link nodded. He was interested in what Warwick wanted to say. Then I recommend that you learn lesser armor and lesser sharpness. They are both level.0 support spells and a high dot quality support magic scroll can sell for a maximum of 12 silver coins, 1.2 gold coins. As you know, we only have to give six silver coins to Derek that we can split the remaining between us. Warwick was extremely clear. Link was bought over immediately and nodded, they are two simple spells, I will master them as soon as possible. To mercenaries, an attacking spell was merely a spontaneous burst of energy and would rarely change the tide of a battle. It was true that supporting spells that could enhance their capabilities for an extended period of time would be more practical. Link would be happy with whatever percentage of the money he got. Anyway, his main source of income would be from the extra scrolls he would be making. I have high expectations. Warwick was confident of Link. He knew that some people had been looking down on this taciturn young magician, but he had a feeling that Link was not someone to be trifled with. Link nodded and headed towards the Academy Plaza. Iliad should already be there waiting for him. Chapter 86 What a pity. You are listening at Novel Full. Audio. Translator. Nyo Ida.bo Studio Editor. Nyo Ida.bo Studio There were two squares within the gates of the East Cove Magic Academy. The one near the entrance was called the Square of Glory, while the other one was a small courtyard inside the academy called Bryant's Inspiration Courtyard. Who was Bryant? As the only magician who rose to legendary level for nearly a thousand years, Bryant was a household name in the Norton Kingdom. Within the magician's circle, he was also known as the Child of the Apocalypse. It was said that this courtyard was where he received the inspiration that would later lead to his upgrade to the legendary level. A century later, the East Cove Magic Academy was built on this valley, and as a tribute to the master magician Bryant. This piece of land was preserved and turned into a courtyard. Rumors had it that once a magician got Bryant's blessings, they would then receive inspiration from the unrivaled legendary magician which would help them break through their current level and reach a higher one. There was, of course, no truth to this hearsay, and no magician actually took it seriously. However, only Link knew that this so dot called Inspiration Courtyard should be called the Seal Courtyard instead, because deep under the grounds of the courtyard was exactly where the Demon Tarvis was sealed. With very few exceptions, no one in the entire academy knew about it. The events that led up to the capture and confinement of the Demon Tarvis happened hundreds of years ago. The horror of the past had faded through the ravaging tooth of time. 
Nowadays, the courtyard was a nice little place with a meticulously trimmed garden, surrounded by woods and streams. In fact, it was now the magician's favorite place to take leisurely walks whenever they needed a break or had time on their hands. Link and Eliard had agreed to meet here. Link walked past lush green grounds, went around the enchanted fountain garden, and finally to the willow grove by the stream. From afar he could see Eliard who was under the willow trees. There were tables and chairs under the shade of the trees. Link walked over and saw Eliard engrossed a magic textbook. Hey, you're early today, said Link, who then sat down on the chair opposite of Eliard. He reached for a round wooden box on the table, opened the lid, and was immediately hit by an appetizing aroma of food that wafted out of it. Wow that sea base soup, soft wheat bread, mushrooms and bacon. What a feast! TSK TSK, Eliard, you lucky bastard, the best cook in the world is in your mage tower. Link tore into the piece of bread. It was both fragrant and soft, and it even had a savory seasoned buttery filling inside, it was just a piece of bread, yet it was irresistibly delectable. This was all thanks to Herrera, the angel of light, otherwise known as the tutor Moira, who put particular emphasis on the quality of life of her apprentices. She employed the best chef in the academy in her mage tower. The apprentices in her mage tower only had to pay a small fee and the cook would prepare a scrumptious meal for them. Whenever Eliard came, he would bring along some food with him to share it with Link. Eliard put down the magic book, smiled and said, food can only bring joy to the body. The only thing that can enrich and delight the soul is magic. I wouldn't mind indulging in these earthly luxuries though, replied Link with a laugh. Link finished his bread, wiped his hand, then flipped through the textbook in Eliard's hand. It was a book that he'd read before, titled Progress in Magic. So you've started to learn level point one spells, Eliard asked Link, slightly surprised. Yeah, I've recently just started to dive into it, Eliard nodded. Link could not help but marvel at the revelation. Eliard really deserved to be called a peerless genius. A month ago, he was still a beginner in magic who had absolutely no skill or knowledge. But now, he had advanced so quickly to level point one spells. Link couldn't imagine how shocked the other apprentices in the academy would be if they found out. Any magician's apprentice who could begin to learn level point one spells within six months would already be deemed a genius. But in a mere month, Eliard could achieve what most other geniuses would need half a year to accomplish, this was irrefutable proof of his formidable talents. Eliard, that's amazing. Link was genuinely impressed. Link knew that the only reason he himself could make progress so quickly was because of the help from the Lord of Light. Eliard, on the other hand, was a pure and unadulterated genius. You're mocking me, said Eliard jokingly while looking at Link with a wry smile. I'm only better than you in the strength of my mana. As for everything else, I'm lagging far behind you. He admired Link's profound insight in magic theory and he knew that he had a long way to go before he could reach Link's level of wisdom. But unfortunately, Link's natural mana was just too weak, and Eliard feared that Link's future paths might be limited because of it. Although Link had told him that his mana was low because of a serious injury, Eliard always assumed that this was something Link believed as a way to encourage himself and never took it seriously. All right, all right, let's stop licking each other's boots, said Link, here, I've brought you six earth spike magical scrolls. Link then handed Eliard the magic scrolls that he smuggled out of his mage tower. Eliard was a favorite of Moira's and she didn't have many apprentices in her mage tower anyway, so Eliard quickly became her chief apprentice who was now in charge of managing the tower's income. Both the income and status of Moira's mage tower were roughly equal to that of Bale's. The magic scrolls and potions that the apprentices prepared, along with the magic materials that they collected were all handed by Eliard, who then sold it. So Link handed over his scrolls for him to sell, which Link thought a most convenient arrangement. Eliard suddenly turned serious while he carefully examined the scrolls. Link, the quality of your scrolls is getting better and better, said Eliard, is this structure one of your new modifications? 
He examined the scrolls, not to check the quality because he knew it had always been superb, what he was appreciating now was the little details added to the scrolls. Link glanced at the spot where Eliard pointed out and nodded. That's right, replied Link. These special structures were only present on the scrolls he handed over to Eliard. Those given to Warwick were all normal magic scrolls. When I was working on it, I had a sudden revelation how the ordinary scroll writing methods only guaranteed the success rate of magic scrolls production but did not maximize the power of the magic scrolls. So, I tinkered about and made some slight changes. Although the preparation process became slightly more complicated now, the power of this earth spike was increased by about 50%, making it much more lethal. That's incredible, exclaimed Eliard, I'll negotiate with the merchant I sold these scrolls to. These scrolls should be able to get the price of a gold coin. Link, did you know our scrolls have been selling like hot cakes? The merchants told me many mercenaries swear by them. They even gave your earth spikes a nickname, they call them, Spears of Death. If you could write more of these modified magic scrolls, I'm sure our sales would go through the roof. Link nodded. He'd heard similar sentiments from Warwick earlier. No problem, I will prepare modified lesser protective armor, basic sharpness spell and lesser invisibility as soon as possible. I'll bring them with me the next time we meet. Link didn't bother to hide his true powers from Eliard. He couldn't even if he wanted to anyway, since they'd been having deep discussions of theories in magic in their letters. They were both well aware of one another's skills and knowledge. Besides, who would refuse to earn more money? Link himself had never thought that he would carve out a name for himself from this small business of magic scrolls. It was as if he'd stumbled upon a pot of gold when he had least expected it. He had a sudden inspiration to start up a business of selling magic gear and weapons and expand it across the fireman continent. If the business thrived, it could turn him into a millionaire. But of course, Link's main focus was still on learning magic. As for the matter of earning money, he would only regard it as a diversion, as something that would support his studies in magic. But he was not in a hurry about it and was taking it step by step, slowly building his prestige. It's a deal then. Eliard was not worried about the speed at which Link could produce the modified magic scrolls at all. He put the magic scrolls away and the two magicians began to enjoy the lunch that Eliard brought. After they had finished eating, they rested for a while, and then they began to exchange their thoughts and experiences in magic as usual. There was no doubt that Eliard was a genius. On Earth, his IQ would have definitely been more than 200. Link was an archmage in his previous life, and on top of that was given a boost by the Lord of Light, so his brain power was no less incredible. Both young men's thinking speed was astonishingly fast and active. One of them would only say a few words, and the other would immediately catch the other's meaning. They would then answer with their own insights, and these insights were often sharp and instructive. If someone were to overhear their conversation, they would probably think that the two were talking gibberish. But that's what happened when two extraordinary minds conversed and engaged. Their discussions were always fast.paced, lively and full of creative ideas. It would be best not to try to understand their thoughts as it would only serve to confuse and bewilder. Because Link had a deeper insight into magical theories and facts, he was the one who took the lead in most parts of their conversation. I was studying the level point one fireball spell recently and I think the fireball's magic structure is far from perfect and can be improved at C.Position. What do you think about this? asked Eliard as he sketched a structure onto a piece of goatskin paper. Link glanced and shook his head, then erased a small portion of the structure that Eliard had shown him and added changes in two different spots. Maybe this is better, said Link. Oh. You're right, that's much better. Wait, isn't that the alpha dot structure in the invisibility spell? Is this an invisible fireball spell, asked the bewildered Eliard. Huh, it's something I came up with when I was studying lesser invisibility answered Link, you see, these changes would greatly reduce the light of the fireball, which would be useful in making sneak attacks. But this is just a theory. You'd have to figure out the way to actually cast the spell yourself. 
Eliud was then lost in his thoughts. He was pondering the feasibility of the structure Link had proposed. He believed that there would be no serious structural issue because Link's recommendations were theoretically and logically sound. Ah, why must Link's mana be so weak? If only there was a way to strengthen his innate mana, he would definitely become one of the best magicians in the East Cove Magic Academy. What a pity. There was no jealousy in Eliard's heart. All he felt for Link was genuine compassion and sympathy. Time flew by, and before the two young magicians knew it, two hours had passed. Both Eliard and Link felt they had learned so much from their conversation. Link stood up and stretched, then said, It's late, I must go back now. Eliard nodded, then slipped out a letter and handed it to Link. My tutor wanted me to pass this letter to you, said Eliard. Link often asked Eliard's tutor, Moira, questions about magic, and Eliard was always the messenger between the two. The correspondence between Link and Moira was nothing new to Eliard. Link, however, was shocked. Herrera had answered the last questions he sent her only two days ago. Why would she send another letter so soon after the last one? Had something happened? Chapter 87 Eternal Darkness, New Avenues of Release You are listening at NovelFull.audio Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio Despite being doubtful, Link received the letter and said, Eliard, send my greetings to your teacher. I will. Eliard kept the items on the stone table and left after setting the date for their next meeting. Link did not leave immediately. He looked around and after making sure no one was looking, then opened Herrera's letter. There was only a small paragraph on the letter. It was not written in human language, but in a long-lost language from an ancient earth spirit civilization. Link specifically learned this language in order to converse with Herrera. I am sorry to disturb, my friend. The situation this time around is slightly special. Master Anthony has informed me that the Academy's detection spell once again detected a strange dark energy coming from the Gervant Forest. While it is carefully hidden, the overflowing energy suggests the user might be extremely powerful, probably similar to the standard of a level 0.6 magician. I have already sent the magic crow to investigate and will personally interfere once I have gotten concrete evidence. However, to not raise the suspicion of Magician Bale, this will be a secret mission. I may need the assistance of another magician then. If you are willing to travel with me, please contact me so that I can make the necessary preparations. I will give a good reason for you to take a leave of absence from the academy and predict the journey to begin in a month. This is extremely dangerous. If you truly wish to travel with me, please be prepared. The moment Link finished reading, the letter combusted with a brilliant flame. At the same time, a new mission appeared in his field of vision. New mission. Traveling together. Mission. Leave the academy when the time is ripe to help Herrera in her investigation into the origin of the dark energy in the Gervant Forest. Reward. 100 Omni Points Link shuddered at the sight of such a hefty reward. This would be a difficult mission. But could he reject Herrera's request? Of course not. Herrera was an angel of light, and a strong ally in his fight against the dark forces. If she required assistance, he would gladly render it. Link accepted the mission. Luckily, there was still a month before the mission began. By then, Link would have recovered from his weakened state and his Domingo Crystal will be purified. He should also be able to invent a few more supreme magical skills in this period, accumulating a few more Omni Points. He would become an extremely strong level point four magician by then. This should be enough to deal with the mission. However, even with so much equipment and spells, Link was still afraid. He remembered that darkness always emerged from new openings whenever another was sealed off. While Link had certain knowledge of the openings up until now, he had no background information on these new openings. As he continued rewriting history, he was also slow in losing his advantage of knowing the future. Darkness is always present, it has merely found another way to release its power. 
I wonder what kind of calamities will be unleashed when it eventually goes out of control. Link sighed. It was already four o'clock in the afternoon and the sun was setting. Link had a busy day and casually strolled back to Bale's mage tower, preparing to take a good rest. When he reached the hall, he saw the apprentices assembling in front of the podium, and Derek seemed to be announcing something important as the manager of the mage tower. Link headed quietly to his seat in the corner and listened. All in all, the royal army has issued a huge order, and they have high expectations for the quality, especially the stability of the equipment. We will have to complete the order in time and give our highest quality equipment. Derek was full of energy and inspiration, but the apprentices listening had a pained expression on their face. After listening for a while, Link understood. It seemed like the Nordic Kingdom was preparing to launch a revenge assault on the prowling kingdom of the Dark Elves in the Dark Forest. Naturally, they would need a variety of resources, such as magic scrolls and potions for their battle. In the game, after the massacre in Gladstone City, the Dark Elves received divine blessings from the Spider Queen Lolf, and got their hands on a divine weapon. The Nordic Kingdom had been suffering defeats ever since. History is changing, I wonder what will be the result this time. For some weird reason, Link felt especially worried. As Link was late to the meeting, he went straight to Warwick to inquire more about the mission. Warwick, what kind of mission is this? Warwick was clearly troubled. He fully extended his five fingers and said, from today onward, everyone will have to write five magic scrolls per day, for a total of twenty days. Our mage tower was assigned to write 800 level point zero magic scrolls. I will also help with the writing. Link immediately understood. There were only seven apprentices in charge of writing magic scrolls in the mage tower. With the addition of Warwick, that would be eight. To be able to complete 800 scrolls in 20 days, that would mean 100 scrolls per person, thus five scrolls per day. However, the mana and energy of the apprentices were limited. The more scrolls they wrote, the higher their chance of failure due to fatigue. Five magic scrolls per day was a huge burden for a low dot level magician's apprentice. As a high dot level magician's apprentice in charge of magic scrolls, Warwick would then have to personally fill in the gaps if the low dot level apprentices could not perform. Dot Warwick felt terrible simply thinking about the days ahead. Link had an idea. Are there any specific requirements for the scrolls, he asked. Yes. The army only wants lesser sharpness and lesser armor supporting magic scrolls. But I only know lesser armor. If Link had said that he already mastered both spells, it would cause a great ruckus in the mage tower. Mastering a level point zero spell in two weeks seemed just about right. What? You learned lesser armor. Warwick's eyes lit up. He did not factor Link into his calculations because Link had only been writing Earth Spike Scrolls all along. I just mastered it, and I'm still not too used to them yet. I am afraid of announcing it. Link stuck out a finger and tapped himself lightly. After one second, a pale green glow enveloped his body. This was indeed the level point zero spell, Lesser Armor. Warwick was at a loss for words. It's fine, completely fine, just practice more and you will get used to it. Ha, what good news. That meant a total of nine people will be participating, Warwick felt a weight lifted off his shoulders. When Derek was done speaking, Warwick assembled the apprentices and announced, time is tight and we have a lot of scrolls to make. Begin as soon as possible. He distributed ten blank scrolls and a bottle of silver ink to everyone. All the apprentices sighed while they collected their ink and scrolls. Link, on the other hand, kept silent. He was not the slightest bit anxious about the creation of magic scrolls and went back to his room to read. As for the magic scrolls, he would get to it after he was tired of reading and ran out of inspiration for his thesis, it was simply an easy task. All good news is usually accompanied by bad news. The next day, an accident occurred. Two magic apprentices were too nervous about the scroll writing task that they burned the midnight oil in an attempt to complete them. 
Due to extreme fatigue, they made mistakes and caused their mana to rebound back to their bodies, dealing serious internal damage. While they were still alive due to the relatively low dot level of their mana, they would need about a month to recover. These two apprentices were not allowed to use magic for the whole month. As such, the number of people writing the scrolls was reduced to a pathetic seven, with one of them being Link, a newbie to the spell. Warwick simply wished no more accidents would happen. Five scrolls a day, nothing more, if you feel tired do not force yourself to complete the mission. I will think of a way. Warwick was afraid his apprentices would overwork and kept emphasizing the issue of health. On the other hand, Warwick himself was going insane from writing magic scrolls in fear that the order would not be met. He actually wrote eight scrolls in one night, at the expense of his concentration and sanity. Warwick even planned to purchase some scrolls from the market to make up the numbers. However, the magic scrolls in the market had already been bought up by the army. Even if he wanted to pay royalties for the scrolls, they were nowhere to be found. What a pitiful guy. Link felt sorry for him and decided to lend him a hand. He could also use this chance to create waves in the Mage Tower. Chapter 88 As beautiful as a work of art you are listening at novelfull.audio Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio Bales Mage Tower, in the main hall on the first floor. Four scrolls, five scrolls, four scrolls. Zack, why did you only submit three scrolls, asked Warwick, staring at the simple and honest apprentice in front of him while massaging his temple. I had rotten luck yesterday. I made the same mistake three times in a row, so I dared not continue after that. In the process of magic scroll preparation, making a series of mistakes was a sign exhaustion. That meant that one's focus was no longer sustainable. When this happened, the best thing to do was to put down the quill and take a rest. If you were to force yourself to go on working, dangerous accidents were likely to happen. This was a valuable lesson passed down from generation to generation. In magic, one must take every precaution because recklessness was the main cause of accidents. Knowing this, Warwick couldn't think of anything to say. But he noticed how sullen Zack had turned, so he had to say something to comfort him. Don't worry, I'll find a solution, said Warwick. I'm really sorry, Warwick, said Zack, wrought with guilt. The six magicians' apprentices then collected all the magic scrolls they produced in a day, including the six magic scrolls that Warwick himself had worked his tail off to produce. Today he received 30 magic scrolls, so when added to yesterday's 35, Warwick now had a total of 65 magic scrolls. But they only had 20 days, and with this pace, they'd be lucky to be able to produce 700 magic scrolls. Producing 800 was simply impossible. We're lagging too far behind schedule. Warwick had lost all hopes of completing the task. All he was thinking now was how to break the news to Derek. Our tutor is a proud magician. He'd be furious if he found out that we couldn't complete the task. Then he'd lose his temper and make our lives a nightmare. Warwick had already begun to imagine the gloomy days ahead. Click. It was the sound of Link opening the door of the small room under the staircase. Link came out from with his hands full of magic scrolls. Link, how many did you manage to produce today? asked Warwick, whose eyes lit up instantly when he saw Link. As he was speaking, his eyes were fixed on the magic scrolls in Link's hands. He started to count them silently. It's my lucky day today and I guess I'm starting to get the hang of it. Anyway, I managed to produce five of them, said Link as he handed over the magic scrolls. Warwick perked up immediately. He did not expect the beginner to have produced five magic scrolls on only the second day. In fact, Warwick himself had only managed to produce two yesterday. He took the magic scrolls and accordingly examined them one by one. As always, the scroll's surface was very neat, and the brushwork of the magic runes was full of a sense of fluidity that was hard to describe in words. The mana within the magic scrolls flowed in a simple and elegant manner, giving the observer a pleasant feeling. 
These are all high dot quality magic scrolls. Excellent job. Warwick couldn't help but praise. He found that just looking at Link's magic scrolls gave him a sense of pleasure. In fact, he wanted to keep staring at them and was reluctant to put it away. Naturally, all five scrolls were perfect. Warwick put the magic scrolls down carefully, and then looked at Link's face, and asked with concern, How do you feel today? Are you tired? No, I'm fine. I don't feel tired at all, Link calmly answered after shaking his head. That's good, then. But remember not to be reckless and take a rest when you're tired. Don't ever force yourself too hard, Warwick repeated the same advice. He was still shaken after losing two apprentices. I got it, replied Link, with a ghost of a smile on his face. Producing five magic scrolls was nothing to him. In fact, he actually produced fifteen today, but he didn't want to show all of it to Warwick for fear of causing a commotion. He'd actually only spent an hour and a half to produce those magic scrolls. He even had half a day's time to read the textbook after that, and then spent a long time working on his thesis before coming out of the room. All in all, the whole business of producing magic scrolls did not affect his studies at all. On the fourth day, Link doubled his efforts and produced twenty magic scrolls. He spent the whole day working on lesser protective armor magic scrolls. He became so adept at it that he could do it with his eyes closed and not make a single mistake. Link was a perfectionist though and he paid attention to every little detail no matter what he's doing, so his magic scrolls had actually gotten better and better in quality. When it was time to submit the scrolls in the early evening, Link saw Warwick mired in gloom. Warwick, what's the matter? Link asked. Everyone's dog got tired, and we'd only received 28 scrolls today. I'm sure we'll produce less and less every day. If we go on like this, there's simply no way we would ever complete the task. Warwick sluggishly replied, his body was slumped on the table. Warwick himself had only produced five scrolls today. After three days of straining himself to produce as many magic scrolls as possible, he was now wrung out like a towel. It was now obvious that he couldn't manage it alone and that he must report to Derek and ask for his help. After finishing his sentence, he looked up at Link, and saw him holding a huge pile of scrolls. Are those really? Warwick was stupefied, he wondered if the scrolls in Link's hands really were magic scrolls. It seemed there were more scrolls now than there was yesterday. Luck really was on my side today, and I managed to produce seven magic scrolls. Here you go, said Link, smiling as he gently placed his magic scrolls on Warwick's table. What? Seven scrolls. That's impossible, exclaimed Warwick, jolting up from his languid position. Seven magic scrolls wouldn't have been such an incredible number if Link was a high-dot-level magician's apprentice. But Link was clearly a novice with very weak mana and had in fact just learned to prepare lesser protective armor magic scroll days ago. How could he possibly produce seven magic scrolls in a day? Warwick's voice was quite loud just now, and many apprentices heard him and began to gather around. Among them was Matt, who had only managed to produce three magic scrolls each day for these past few days. What about the quality of the magic scrolls, though, asked Matt, who was understandably skeptical. He was a mid-level magician's apprentice, but he'd had a run of bad luck these few days, which made him more and more anxious by the day. Even three scrolls a day had required him to stretch almost to his limits. So how could a newcomer who had only arrived days earlier produce more than twice his number? Yeah, they're not useless scrolls, are they, someone else chimed in. In fact, seven magic scrolls a day, for all the apprentices in the hall, was undeniably impressive. Of all the apprentices gathered there, Warwick who had produced eight magic scrolls on the first day, was probably the only one who could surpass this number. Warwick was still speechless. He unfolded Link's magic scroll one by one and began to examine them. As soon as the magic scrolls were unfolded, the apprentices around all broke into muffled cries of wonder. How could magic scrolls be so pleasing to the eye? Why does the flow of mana on the scrolls enchant me so much? 
These were the thoughts running through the apprentice's head after Link's magic scrolls were unveiled. They're magnificent, someone whispered. These were all magicians' apprentices, after all, so they knew a high dot quality magic scroll when they saw one. In fact, most of them could judge the quality of a magic scroll in one glance. Although these were just level.0 lesser protective armor magic scrolls, they knew that in order to produce such superior magic scrolls, immense willpower and talent were required. Suddenly, the apprentices began to view Link in a new light. They couldn't help but respect him for having achieved such a miraculous feat initially, most of the apprentices in the Mage Tower regarded Link as a nobody whose existence was dispensable. But now, their views were beginning to change. Then, Warwick checked the second magic scroll. Once he unfurled it, he saw the same smooth flowing magic runes, and the same elegant and harmonious mana flow. The scroll gave the observer a sense of enchantment that made them unwilling to put it down or look away from it. Lord of Light, what a wonderful magic scroll. It's as beautiful as a work of art. I don't think I could ever bring myself to use it, whispered one of the apprentices after a long appreciative sigh. Creating a magic scroll was like calligraphy, in a sense. When a word was well written, it became a work of art that could be sold for a lot of gold coins. But if the same word was written poorly, then it's no different from the scratchings of a dog, for which no one would bother to give a second glance. Judging from the apprentice's reactions, Link's magic scrolls were works of art. After Warwick had checked Link's magic scrolls one by one, he found that all seven were, without exception, of the highest quality. The crowd burst into another wave of exclamations. If only one or two of the magic scrolls were excellent, then it could still be regarded as a result of dumb luck. But when all seven were incredible, it could only mean that Link was truly talented. The strength of his mana might be pitifully weak, but from now on no one could deny the fact that he was extremely gifted in producing marvelous magic scrolls. Link had been in Bale's Mage Tower for more than half a month, but today was the first day that he was truly recognized by the other apprentices. Little did they know, though, that producing seven scrolls a day was just the beginning. Chapter 89 The first loophole in the fortress you are listening at novel full dot audio. Translator Nyo I.B.O. Studio Editor Nyo I.B.O. Studio Even though Link was submitting seven scrolls per day, it was still not sufficient to fill in the gap of 100 scrolls. Left with no choice, Warwick went to knock on the door of magician Derek. Who is it? Derek's voice rang from inside the room. Somehow, he sounded slightly nervous. How strange, maybe Derek is doing something that he doesn't want others to know. Warwick thought. Derek was quite introverted and didn't have much talent in magic. He was thus not exactly respected amongst the apprentices. It's me, Warwick. Why did you come here at this ungodly hour? Derek clearly sounded displeased. His footsteps were getting closer and the door slowly opened. Derek stood behind the door with a vexed expression. The moment the door creaked open, Warwick picked up a faint odor with his sensitive sense of smell. What is this? It smells slightly like sulfur and a bit like rosin, there is even a slight hint of rotting flesh. This is weird. Warwick had never experienced anything like this before. Be quick. What do you want to say? Derek rumbled, breaking Warwick's train of thought. Oh, the thing is. Warwick was afraid to speak. After mumbling for a few seconds, he noticed Derek's growing look of annoyance and timidly said, Sir, we may not be able to complete the order on time. As expected, this sentence caused Derek to frown with annoyance, what exactly happened? I remember you had eight, no, with the addition of the new guy, nine helpers. Eight hundred scrolls in twenty days should not be difficult, am I right? No, we are only left with seven. Hansen and Manster suffered damages from mana rebound. I am only receiving 35 scrolls per day. Sir, I have been writing five scrolls every day as well. We have all done our best but it is still not enough. We are still 100 scrolls short. 
Warwick helplessly threw out his hands. Derek immediately blew up upon hearing this sentence, damn it. You idiots. How do you expect me to find extra manpower for you at this time? The departments for potions and low-dot-level magic equipment are also short of people. The entire academy is doing their best to complete the order on time. Do you expect me to personally help you? Derek was a level point two magician, to downgrade himself by writing level point zero magic scrolls was simply a joke. He would not accept it. Dot furthermore, he was not adept at writing magic scrolls. His competency in magic scroll writing was probably only the level of a higher magic apprentice. But most importantly, he was busy making money. He was learning a level point three spell and was at the final stages of implementing it. He needed to rent the elemental pool only available to lecturers. The rental fee of the elemental pool was 100 gold coins per hour and his experiment required three hours of usage. Usually, he needed a month to earn 100 gold coins. Hence, he simply had no time to be embroiled in this mess. Warwick was clearly troubled and misunderstood, he shook his head frantically, no sir. Of course not. I am just wondering if we could reduce the number of scrolls we need to produce, for example, 700, no, 750. Derek objected vehemently. The order was discussed and confirmed between Master and the Army. I have no power to change the contract. Damn it, why do I have to deal with this? Derek was in a pinch. As the head of the mid level magic equipment department in the tower, if Warwick made a mistake, the blame would be attributed to Derek instead. Of course, he would not be stripped of his position as a manager. However, it would probably affect his commission which would delay his level point three spell experiment indefinitely. What do I do? Master Bale has been acting weirder by the day. The part where I was tasked to procure strange magical resources was especially disturbing. Oh Lord, why am I so unlucky? Derek's mood was at absolute zero. After pondering for a while, Derek could not think of any good alternatives. If he wanted to facilitate his progress as a magician, he would have to shoulder some of the weight. Left with no choice, he said, I will ask around the other towers to see if they have extra finished scrolls. However, don't count on me for this. Try your best to write more and narrow the gap, understand? Warwick nodded gratefully. Yes sir, I will definitely give it my all. Okay, now go. Derek commanded. However, reality was often harsh and cruel. On the second day after reporting the situation to Derek, Warwick gave his best effort and wrote six magic scrolls. Together with the scrolls he collected from the other apprentices, he received only 25 scrolls in total. Link was the only one who had not submitted his scrolls. Oh no, everyone is starting to feel tired and losing their speed. Warwick thought. If this went on, the gap would widen to 200 or even 300 scrolls. He did not even want to think about that. As Warwick was feeling helpless, a door at the bottom of the stairs punctually opened. Link stood at the entrance with a stack of scrolls in his hand. Warwick's eyes widened with delight and he rushed forward. Link, how many did you write today? Without waiting for the answer, Warwick started counting, 1, 2, 3.8, 9, 10. Did I count correctly? Warwick rubbed his eyes and counted again. As simple as the counting was, Warwick simply couldn't believe it. Just two days ago, Link was only writing five scrolls per day and just yesterday he wrote seven. Now, he was writing ten. This was an amazing exponential increase. Wouldn't he be drained from all this work? Warwick finally confirmed the numbers after counting them once more. He couldn't help but shout, in the name of the God of Light, Link, you really wrote ten scrolls. That is incredible. This number reverberated through the hall and caught the attention of every apprentice. Everyone's attention was immediately captured and assembled towards Link. Ten scrolls a day had been the record of the Mage Tower for the past three years. To think that someone managed to accomplish it was definitely shocking. Warwick, quick, 
examine the quality of the scrolls. If all the scrolls were successful products, Link would be too amazing. Perhaps Link had no talent in mana and was more introverted, but if he continued to produce high dot quality magic scrolls at such an alarming rate, he would definitely earn his place in the East Cove Higher Magic Academy. Warwick swallowed nervously as he began his examination. Many others came forward to inspect the work as well. Unsurprisingly, all ten scrolls were not only successes, but also of premium quality. The strokes were clearly defined and rounded off nicely with a glossy finish. You wouldn't want to let go of it the moment you held it in your hands. The most shocking thing was that the ten scrolls looked exactly the same, as though they were printed using the same stencil. Link, you really are incredible. Warwick had great respect for Link from the bottom of his heart. He truly felt that in terms of magic scroll writing, Link was no doubt the best among all the apprentices. Link merely gave a smile as though this achievement was nothing to be proud of. If there is nothing wrong with the scrolls, I'll be going back to my room. Yes, please rest well, Warwick hastily replied. He had a feeling that their chance of meeting the deadline now depended entirely on Link. Link continued to produce stellar work the next day, submitting 13 magic scrolls. Not only had he broken the record of Bale's Mage Tower, he had also broken the record of the entire East Cove Higher Magic Academy which was at 12 magic scrolls in a day. The quality of his work was, as usual, still of extremely good quality. All of the apprentices were blown away. The news traveled really fast and before long, the whole academy heard of a magic scroll genius in Bale's Mage Tower who wrote 13 premium magic scrolls in a day. The next day, the news got even more absurd, 13 magic scrolls became 14, and eventually, 15 magic scrolls consistently every day. Link was known as a monster. In 10 days, Warwick received a total of 420 magic scrolls, out of which, 120 magic scrolls were written by Link. The other six apprentices, him included, only contributed 300. Link's contribution was more than twice the work of an ordinary apprentice. It seems that we are not only narrowing the gap, but we might even be able to complete the order on time. Warwick calculated the number of scrolls in advance and was in awe. Just then the door below the stairs creaked open again with Link bringing out a thick stack of magic scrolls. Warwick immediately dropped what he was doing and rushed towards him, grinning from ear to ear. Let me carry it. I bought some delicious food from lecturer Moira's mage tower for you. Please go enjoy. Link was now his treasured apprentice, he had to treat him with hospitality. Thank you. Link nodded and dug into the feast Warwick had prepared. By the time he was done, Warwick had also finished his examination of the scrolls. Every single one of them was still of premium quality. I will be going out for a stroll. I got bored from sitting down too long, Link said. He had been wanting to try out a supreme magical skill he developed recently and needed to make a trip to Herrera's mage tower. Yes, please go and relax, Warwick spoke in an unusually polite tone. Derek walked into the tower with a pained expression just three minutes after Link left. The moment he saw Warwick, he hastily asked, how are the magic scrolls coming along? As an official magician, Derek never mixed with the apprentices. Hence, he was completely unaware of the news circulating amongst them. More importantly, he was extremely busy these few days trying to find an alternative to the magic scroll shortage issue. He was out in River Cove Town trying to purchase magic scrolls for a high price and at the same time, generating monetary resources for his own experiment. It was driving him crazy. He did his best, but the results were limited. As of now, he only received 20 magic scrolls. There were only 10 days remaining. If he could not find another alternative, he would have to up down his pride and fill in the gaps himself. He did not expect to be greeted by a jubilant Warwick. Sir, I have good news. The gap has been filled. What? Derek was appalled. Haven't you heard? A magic scroll genius has appeared in the tower, another apprentice joined the conversation. Genius. Who? 
Derek was even more confused. Chapter 90 Now's my chance. You are listening at NovelFull.audio. Chapter 90 Now's my chance. Translator Nyo Ida Studio Editor Nyo Ida Studio Bales Mage Tower Not only did he manage to produce 15 magic scrolls a day, but each scroll's quality was this exquisite, too. Derek stared incredulously at the lesser protective armor magic scrolls unfolded on the table in front of him. Even lay people with no experience in magic would perceive the exquisite beauty of these magic scrolls. In Derek's eyes, as a full dot fledged magician, one word ran through his mind perfection. Even low dot quality blank scrolls and ordinary magical ink provided by the Mage Tower could not conceal the preternatural elegance of the silvery magic aura that the magic runes on the scrolls exuded. The aura of the magic scrolls seemed as graceful and agile as a silvery trout that cruised in a lake bathed in moonlight, while shrouded in the mysterious aura of magic. Derek couldn't peel his eyes away from these scrolls, at times they were so breathtaking that it almost suffocated him. These sublime magic scrolls are too precious to be touched by the coarse hands of those barbaric soldiers, thought Derek. They should be framed and sold at a high price as works of art instead. Yes, it would be much more appropriate to sell these as pieces of artwork rather than as cheap weapons. But perhaps even that was not good enough for these unearthly magic scrolls. Their only minute flaws were the inferior blank scrolls and magical ink, as well as the low dot level spell. Nothing could be done about the low dot level spell, since the creator of these magic scrolls was only a beginner magician's apprentice. He could easily improve the other two factors, though. Young aristocrats love to collect magical items and wealthy merchants like to use them to decorate their storefronts as well. If I were to sell these to them, I'm sure they could fetch at least 10 gold coins each. Derek was short of money, so he had to squeeze out the meager entrepreneurial talents that he had out of desperation. In fact, he even surprised himself for having been able to come up with what he considered to be a shrewd idea. The kid can produce 15 scrolls a day which means that a daily income of 100 gold is a given. As for the kid, I'm sure he'd be happy with 10 gold coins a day. Derek gently coughed and told Warwick, well, I'm relieved there are no apparent problems. Why don't you take these magic scrolls? I bought them in the River Cove town at a high price. Although there are only 20 of them here, I'm sure they could at least slightly ease your stress burden. How much did these scrolls cost? Warwick hastily asked. Experience taught Warwick that Derek was a very stingy man, he would never spend money on anything that would not profit him in the end. But to his surprise, Derek only waved his hand and said, you don't have to pay me for them this time. Just keep on with your hard work and complete the task. Thank you very much for your help, Mr. Derek, said the stunned Warwick, his heart filled with gratitude. Derek replied with a nod. Twenty scrolls really weren't much at all, but still, it was the equivalent of an average magician's apprentice's five days' worth of effort. So now they had 440 completed magic scrolls. In the remaining ten days they'd only need to prepare 360 more magic scrolls which wasn't too much to deal with. Where's Link? asked Derek, I'd like to meet him. He was tired after preparing the magic scrolls, so he went out for a walk, answered Warwick. I see. When he returns, tell him to come to my room, said Derek. I will, replied Warwick. Meanwhile, Link was oblivious to how he had been a part of Derek's scheme. Although to be honest, he had deliberately demonstrated his talents in the magic scrolls because he wanted to attract the attention of some high dot ranking magicians in the Mage Tower. If he kept on mingling with low-dot-level apprentices, there would be no way for him to investigate Bale or learn his secrets. In fact, Link wasn't out for a simple walk either, but was instead going to Moira's Mage Tower. He was going there under the guise of visiting his friend Eilyard, but in truth, he was going to conduct magic experiments. After ten days of preparing magic scrolls, Link had reaped quite a few benefits from the sustained intense focus required in the activity. Through his strict perfectionism, he learned how to control his mana more precisely. 
if he could focus his mana into a point as small as the breadth of a strand of human hair before this, now he had improved so much that he could focus his mana to a point as fine as the breadth of a spider's silk. The smaller the point he could focus his mana onto, the finer the thread of mana that would be used to construct spell structures would be. That meant that the mana consumption for each spellcasting process would be reduced as well and allow for more intricate spell structures to be built. For example, Link now only needed 0.9 mana points to release a glass orb of the same power, while one whistle only consumed 3.5 points. But this wasn't the only benefit Link acquired. By continuously producing magic scrolls of lesser protective armor, he was hit with an inspiration on how to modify the structure of the spell. After dozens of changes, he finally created a new supreme magical skill modification for the spell and integrated it into the level point 2 guarding barrier spell. As a result, he made drastic changes to these spells while also upgrading their levels. The original guarding barrier would cover the surface of the spellcaster's body with a layer of elemental magic which would provide some protection against magic spell attacks. But after modification, a more powerful repulsive field was added on top of the existing barrier, making the spellcaster immune to physical attacks as well. However, because Link spent most of his time in Bale's Mage Tower, this spell had only been running around in his mind with no chance for him to actually test it. Although he had been running countless simulations in his mind to ensure that there were no serious flaws, the newly dot modified guarding barrier had now been upgraded to a level 3 spell. That meant that there would be a higher risk that serious accidents may occur even from the slightest imbalance of energy. Link wouldn't risk testing it out in his room and thought it best to do it in the protective environment of the elemental pool. As he entered Moira's mage tower, Iliard was already at the door waiting to meet him. His face lit up the moment he saw Link. Link, I didn't expect you to be able to produce magic scrolls so quickly. I tried it myself, but I could never exceed 10 scrolls a day, yet you managed to produce 15. That's just scary, said Eliard. I guess I had a lot of practice. I wasn't so quick myself when I first started, said Link, laughing. I'm sure a little bit of genius didn't hurt as well. I mean, I could never produce magic scrolls as sublime as yours in a million years. Iliad understood how difficult it was to create magic scrolls, so he knew there was more to Link's achievement than blind practice. They both chatted and laughed while they walked into the tower. It was Link's first time here, and he noticed how the interior of this mage tower was similar to Bale's, except in a slightly smaller scale and with an additional air of compassion and warmth versus the cold and competitive atmosphere in Bale's mage tower. Link also noticed how the apprentices here laughed and smiled while they were chatting with each other, a foreign sight in Bale's mage tower. When they reached the hall, the apprentices all turned to Iliard and greeted him warmly. My prince, is this your friend? A beautiful female apprentice came up to Iliard and flirtatiously leaned her body on his while giving Link an inquisitive look. Even though everyone had heard the news of a magic scroll genius in Bale's mage tower, very few people knew what he looked like. Elena, stop bothering me, said Iliard as he shoved the girl away, looking somewhat embarrassed. Although his tone sounded cold, Link could sense a tinge of guilt in Iliard's voice. He knew then that the girl Elena must have had him wrapped around her fingers. Poor Iliard, I guess being handsome does come with its own trouble, Link thought sarcastically. Link then diverted his eyes to Elena. She seemed to be about 18 years old and she had long flowing pale blonde hair. She blinked her large sky dot blue eyes a great deal, making her look like an innocent child. But judging from the strength of her mana, she must already be a high dot level magician's apprentice. This made her seem mysterious and effervescent. From Link's first glance, Elena seemed to be both an innocent young girl and a gifted magician. But by the second glance he immediately discarded his first impression of her. He could sense that she had been putting on act. The magician's robe on her body hugged her waistline snugly and she seemed to have spent a great deal of time and effort on her exquisite hairstyle. Finally, there was that affected curiosity she put on when she's around Eliard. Considering how fast she was able to get familiar with Eliard, 
it seems she must have understood Ilyard's obsessive devotion to magic learning and used it to her advantage. Her only fault was that she was still quite young, so her inexperience had made her acts obvious to Link's scrutinizing eyes. Link thought this innocent but looking girl was not to be underestimated. Elena, Elena. What a familiar name. Link couldn't quite put a finger on where he'd heard that name before, though he felt it was uncannily familiar. Then, Iliad turned to Link, wordlessly asking for his permission before he introduced Link to everyone in the hall, to which Link nodded in assent. He had no need to hide his identity here. Everyone, Iliad began. This is Link, the magic scroll genius from Bale's Mage Tower. You've all heard about him, haven't you? Oh. Before Iliard could finish his sentence, gasps echoed through the hall. The apprentices all turned their eyes to Link. They examined Link up and down, eager to find out what a genius looked like. The apprentices were soon disappointed, though. Because of the greatly improved living conditions in the academy, Link had actually gained some weight and grown slightly taller too, but that did nothing to improve his terribly plain and unremarkable appearance. I wouldn't know him from Adam, said one apprentice in a deflated tone. He's got a very weak aura, said another, honestly, I'm not sure how his mana could sustain him through the process of preparing fifteen magic scrolls. I guess the rumors were exaggerated, one of them concluded. No, you're all wrong. Iliard is a true genius, so his friend must be great as well. That was Elena. She managed to refute the previous remarks while simultaneously flattering Iliard without offending Link. With all the clamoring voices that erupted after that, Iliard was getting irritated. He thought they were all too tactless and wanted to say a few words in Link's defense. Iliard, I don't have much time, let's go, said Link before Iliard could say anything. Link had actually snuck out of the mage tower and only had two hours before he must go back. Right, follow me. Iliad walked towards the stairs and Link followed him closely behind. No one else was around once they reached the second floor. Tell me about Elena. You both seem very intimate with each other. So you found yourself a lover, huh? Joked Link. What are you talking about? I never thought of her that way, replied Iliard, with a wry smile on his face, but Elena is a nice girl, she's helped me a lot, so I dot well. Fine, I get it, said Link, nodding his head. It seemed that Elena really was a sly fox who had identified Iliard's weakness. Shrewdness in a woman wasn't necessarily a bad thing, but it depended on how she used that strength. Link wasn't sure what was going on exactly between Iliard and Elena, so he thought it best to stay away and not to meddle. The two finally reached the third floor where the elemental pool was. The role of an element pool was to control the scale and limit the power of magic spells. When magic spells were cast within the zone of the elemental pool, even high dot level spells would have the power equivalent to that of level point zero spells. This allowed the magicians to conduct high dot energy experiments without having to worry about causing dangerous accidents. There were three elemental pools in Herrera's Mage Tower. The main pool could contain level 0.5 magic spells and below, while the other two could contain magic spells that were level 0.3 and below. One of the smaller elemental pools was open to the apprentices and there was time allotted each week when the apprentices could use it for free. Iliard held the key to this elemental pool. Iliard had 20 hours of free elemental pool usage per week. He never used up all the time himself, so Link borrowed his allotted time to conduct his experiment here. The experiment Link had in mind today was a relatively simple one. He'd only used the elemental pool just to be extra cautious, so in the end Link only spent half an hour in there. Half an hour later, Link's newly dot modified defensive spell was fully developed. The new spell was drastically different from the original guarding barrier. After casting the spell, Link's clothes were no longer covered in a glass dot like film but was shrouded in a nebulous light instead. The light extended about three feet away from his body. The elemental barrier mingled within the light and when seen from a distance, it had an appearance of a fuzzy white cotton ball. 
I'll call it Edelweiss, then, thought Link. Edelweiss level 0. 0.3 elite defensive spell mana consumption. 25 points. Spell casting time. 0. 0.9 seconds effects. Effectively resists both physical and magic spell attacks. Note. This is Link's Edelweiss. When he was done testing out the new spell, a rather familiar notification popped up, containing two messages. Player Link successfully created a new level 0.2 Supreme Magical Skill. 10 Omni Points Rewarded. The other one was an upgrade mission. Player has successfully mastered a level 0.3 spell and advanced to level 0.3. 40 Omni Points Rewarded. Level 0.4 Upgrade Mission Activated. Mission Details. Master a level 0.4 spell and become a level 0.4 magician. Mission Rewards. 70 Omni Points Link's total Omni Points was now at 125 points and there were less than 20 days left before the effects of ailing mana would disappear. By that time, his maximum mana would be 1480 points, which meant he could then use the level 0.4 Flame Blast spell again. Plus, he even had a level 0.5 Universal Crystal now, so he would no doubt experience an exponential leap in his strength soon. Link was very much looking forward to this. After leaving the elemental pool, Link bid farewell to Eliard and immediately headed back to Bale's Mage Tower. As soon as he opened the front door, Warwick was already there waiting for him. Link, Derek wants to see you, said Warwick. Now's my chance. The moment that Link anticipated had arrived.